This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society. In this module, we are examining modern speech technologies. This includes automatic speech recognition and speech synthesis. In this lecture, we're going to examine one important component of automatic speech recognition in a little more depth. The component that we're going to look at is the acoustic model. The acoustic model is an important component in automatic speech recognition. By the end of this lecture, you should have a high level understanding of the goal of the acoustic model and a basic understanding of how it works. Let's back up and look at the use case in question. Here we have a user asking a smart device, such as a smartphone, what the weather is. So the user says, hey Siri, will it rain today? Now we're gonna ask what happens next. What's going on on the smartphone after the user speaks? So as the user speaks, there's a sound wave, a set of pressure waves coming out of the user's mouth. This represents the speech signal. The first thing that happens is that the sound wave encounters the microphone on the smartphone. So the microphone includes an analog to digital converter that is capable of, rec of recognizing the sound as it comes in, in pressure waves, and converting that analog sound wave signal into a digital signal that can then be utilized on device. The next task is to take the digitized sound wave and extract features that will then be used to recognize the phones spoken in the sound wave. So, let's look at the purpose and goal of using the acoustic model. The acoustic model takes as its input a digitized speech signal. The desired output will be a recognized sequence of phones. Remember that a phone is a basic unit of speech. So for any language, that language will have a set of phones that the speakers of that language utilize when speaking. At this point, let's switch over to a whiteboard and look at what a sound wave might look like. Here we have page 190 in the textbook. This is an example of a digitized sound wave, or rather a visualization of a digitized sound wave for the waveform utterance John saw a dog. So someone has manually analyzed the sounds in this signal and marked which periods on along the x-axis, which represents time, correspond with each sound. So that speech signal was had a lot going on. Let's zoom in on one small segment and see what this graph might look like at the most basic level. So on the oops, on the x-axis, we're going to draw, we're going to represent time. On the y-axis, we're going to represent amplitude 
of the sound wave. The amplitude tells us how strong the pressure was that was recorded at the microphone at any given point in time. So a sound wave might look something like this when viewed at this scale on a graph. So we can look and see that in it, at any given point in time, there's a measurement that at that point in time, we have a particular amplitude. Now we'll notice that the sound wave has peaks and the sound wave has valleys. So the peaks will have a certain amplitude, as will the valleys. And we'll notice here that we also have recurring peaks. So here we have a peak, here we have a peak, here we have another peak. There's another important technical measurement that we can make on a sound wave or any kind of wave, and that is the frequency. You can measure the frequency of the wave. The frequency says, how long does it take for the sound wave to go from peak one to peak two, or from peak two to peak three? So the frequency is going to be a measure that tells us how long it takes to get between them. More technically, what we're going to be doing is recording frequency in cycles per second or hertz, abbreviated as HZ. So the frequency in hertz tells us how many of these cycles we will encounter over one second of a recording. A cycle is going from one peak to the next peak, or equivalently from a valley to the next valley. So this is what we've got. And let's switch back over here. Excuse me. So when we look here at this diagram, what we've, what we've got here is a sound wave, just like what I just showed you, only we're really far zoomed out. So we can't see the X axis very well because, uh, because of the long period of time that we're looked at, looking at. But if we zoomed in really close, we would see something very similar to what I just showed you. Okay, so things that we could measure about the sound wave if we're trying to recognize the speech. We could measure the time, the amount of time that the sound was uttered, the length of the recording. We could measure the maximum amplitude or the minimum amplitude. We could measure the frequency. So it turns out that the sound waves that we create when we speak are actually much more complicated than the sound wave that I'm showing you here. So if we played a sound wave that looked like this, it would sound pretty much like a pure sound tone, not a siren, but just, just a pure tone at whatever uh, frequency we're listening to. So if you have a musical instrument and you play just one pure tone, and look at that tone in a graph like this, it would look much more like this. Now, what do, the, what do the sound waves that we actually use to speak look like? Well, it turns out that if you have, you can have a complicated sound wave that looks more like that, for example. This is just an arbitrary drawing, but it shows you a more complicated sound wave. So what is this? This is a complicated sound wave. Okay, so 
real speech is going to look more like this. So if we want to extract information that we can use to recognize the phones that were used when the speaker created this sound wave, we need to be able to extract things like frequency and amplitude. So if we have a complicated sound wave, this is as far as far about as far as we're going to go into signal processing. If you're interested in more of this, you could, could look into classes on digital signal processing, which might be offered by the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department or less likely computer science or linguistics. Most commonly, a digital signal processing class will be offered in an ECE department, an electrical or computer engineering department. So, if we have two simple sound waves, there's one, here's another, so these are two simple sound waves. If you take the frequency at any given point in time, so these share a common x-axis, time, but each of these is going to have its own mini y-axis, so time. So the time is synchronized. So if we take any given point in time, we can calculate we can just read off the amplitude of sine uh, of wave one at that time and wave two at that time. And we could plot, let's call this A, amplitude one and amplitude two. If we take amplitude one and add amplitude two, we get amplitude three. And we could plot amplitude three on a graph. There's A3. And we could continue doing that for every point in time. And if we do, adding these two waves together by adding the amplitude at any given point in time will result in a sine wave that looks like these two waves added together. So it'll look something more like this, where there's characteristics of both waves. And it turns out that you can do this again and again. You can take many component sound waves, add them together, and get a complicated sound wave. So bear with me here. If, you're, if you've never encountered digital signal processing before, if you've never encountered a sound wave, that's, that's OK. Remember the big picture. We've got a recording like when you speak to your smartphone, saying, hey Siri, what's the weather? And when you graph that sound wave after it's been recorded and digitized by your microphone, you get a complicated sound wave that looks like this. Our goal, remember, is to figure out what were the sequences of phones that the user spoke. And Recall the context here. Is that we're trying to extract features. So where we're going with this is we're trying to determine what the features look like. So from this complicated sound wave, what do the features look like? And it turns out that the first step in doing that is to reconstruct the set of simple sound waves 
that made up this complicated sound wave. And there's a process for doing that. Uh, it involves a Fourier transform. We're not going to go into the math that's involved. If you're interested in the math, I encourage you to take a digital signal processing class or research on your own for what a fast Fourier transform does. The result, though, is that we've got this process that involves a fast Fourier transform, which we can think of as just this black box mathematical tool that takes a complicated sound wave as input and produces a set of simple sound waves. Okay? This is going to be really important, this set of simple sound waves. It'd be nice if we could see a picture of what this set of simple sound waves looked like. The, this another way of visualizing this complicated sound wave that's our actual recording. Well, it turns out there is. Let's go back here, where we said that a complicated sound wave can be formed by adding the amplitudes at any given point in time of two different component sound waves. So that means that we could draw a graph that looks like this. So on one dimension, we're still going to have time. That's our x-axis. Our y-axis is going to be the component frequencies. So our y-axis is going to tell us which simple sounds we found. Okay, so this is frequencies. So let's take this particular example. So let's say that the frequency of sound wave one is 100 hertz. The numbers that I'm using here are completely arbitrary and are not going to correspond to the frequencies that you would actually use. I'm not a speech researcher. If you talk to a speech researcher, uh, we have one in our department here at the University of Illinois in the Linguistics Department, Yan Tang. He could tell you what frequencies you would likely encounter in a real speech signal. But I'm going to stick with the simple one here, 100 hertz and uh, 50 hertz. So we've got 150, 100 hertz and 50 hertz. Uh, my drawings are not to scale. But the point here is that we're going to have a, a point on our y-axis that's going to represent 50 hertz, and another point on our y-axis that's going to represent 100 hertz. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the, the cool thing. We're actually also going to have a z-axis that is the third dimension. And the z-axis is going to be amplitude. So amplitude, re remember, was the y-axis on our simpler graphs. Amplitude, time. So we're going to take this graph, amplitude versus time, and turn it so that we've got the x-axis and the amplitude will now be the z-axis. 
So at 100 hertz, we're going to have a X, Z axis plot that looks exactly like this one at 100 hertz on the Y axis. And at 50 hertz on the Y axis, we're going to have a plot that on the X versus Z axis looks exactly like this wave you see here. Okay, so this is really hard to draw. I'm not going to try, but it would be coming out of this, coming out right here. We've got a wave on the X versus Z axis at 50 hertz and another wave coming out at the time X versus amplitude Z axis at 100 hertz. Okay, I'm about to show you a picture that hopefully will make this a lot clearer. And I'm hoping that by starting here and remembering that we actually have three axes, time, frequency, and amplitude, that the picture that I'm about to show you from the book will make more sense than it did when you read it the first time. So let's switch over to our book. Here was the sound wave. Let's zoom out and go a couple more pages. And this is actually a three-dimensional plot. This is exactly what I was just talking about, smushed into two dimensions. So what we have here on the x-axis is time, just like I showed you before. x-axis on both plots is time. y-axis on both plots is frequency. z-axis on both plots is amplitude. Now, how do you draw, how do you render a three-dimensional picture in 2D? Well, the way that this plot does it is using darkness. So, in the plot shown here in the PDF, a dark point represents high amplitude on the z-axis. A very light point represents low amplitude on the z-axis. And so we can see here that this turns into a visualization of the component frequencies found in the sound wave. So we've got a frequency here marked at 200 923, excuse me, around 900 hertz, where the dotted line is, going all the way up to 5,000 hertz. And this is an actual visualization in three dimensions of the speech signal after you have decomposed the complicated speech signal into its component parts. Okay? This is called a spectrogram. So this three-dimensional plot of a complicated sound wave is called a spectrogram. And on the spectrogram, time is on the x-axis, frequency is on the y-axis, and amplitude is on the z-axis. And the z-axis is drawn as light versus dark so that it can be rendered successfully in two dimensions. We're gonna stop there for this video. And then in the next video, I'll show you how we go from the spectrogram to the acoustic features.